Would you use alternate no. pronouns? So that's you they being appear lazy, that way. Jordan. I think if you just stop centering this whole controversy on yourself. It's not even a principle, it's the fundamental method by which our societies manage to maintain the stability that they do maintain. This debate is an old favourite of mine because it's from when Jordan Peterson first came under attack for his stance on Bill C-16. And it's quite interesting to watch just how he conducts himself during these interviews and also how right he was about all of this. There are a few wow moments in this that I did not pick up on last time. So hindsight always paints it in a new light. Let's get into the clips. Uh, Professor Peterson, let's begin with you. Uh, why are you against the use of alternate pronouns? I'm, not, I'm against the use of, of le legislation to determine what words are that myself and other people are required to utter. But would you use alternate pronouns if a student asked you to? I think I've made my position on that clear already. Well, perhaps not to our audience at home who are just being introduced to this. Would you use alternate no. pronouns? And why not? I, because I don't believe that other people have the right to determine what language I use, especially when it's backed by punitive legislation. And when the words that are being required are the constructions, they're artificial constructions of people I regard as radical ideologues whose viewpoint I do not share. Well, I, we have a graphic to show our audience at home, uh, just some of the pronouns uh, being used or asked to be used as alternates. Among them you see here, uh, Z or Zim, uh, Z or here, Z or Zir, also hey. Uh, or A rather, and per. Look how ice cold Dr. Peterson is in this video. He was obviously very intentional during these conversations and he wanted to stay calm and composed and not say or do anything that would land him in hot water because he knows that they were just waiting to misconstrue what he was saying. So he stays very matter of fact about everything and his body language gives him a very powerful and confident presence throughout this debate. He's not fidgeting and looking nervous and anxious. He's got discerning hunter eyes on the whole time during the debate, which says I'm not here to play games and he stays stone-faced rather than showing his teeth and making himself look like prey. And I do think that all of this would have been very, very deliberate. And this is something that you can take notes on because if you do ever find yourself in a very heated situation like an interrogation, God forbid, or a heated and emotionally charged debate, then this sort of powerful body language will really come in handy, especially when somebody is saying or doing things that are designed to get an emotional reaction out of you and make you lose your cool so that you look bad. So just some of the alternate pronouns there. Uh, Professor Pete, when you hear Professor Peterson saying that this is oppressive, how do you respond to that? Um, well, uh the Peterson drama has done real harm to real people on campus. He's made it harder to be transgender or non-binary. Um, I know this from personal experience. I'm non-binary and transgender, and I know how it's felt to be on the U of T campus for the last month. And I also know from uh, private communications with other affected people. Um, you know, in New Zealand where I grew up, uh, academics have a statutory role enshrined in the Education Act to be a critic and conscience of society. So I think that's a, an idea worth exporting to Canada. So I'd like to give Peterson about a B plus for his critic role recently and a, an F for the conscience part. Um, a student uh, once said to me when I finally obtained tenure, now professor, that the, now that you have obtained superpowers, you must agree to use them for good for peace and justice. Okay, okay, that was weird. Yeah. Were you yelling? So I invite uh, Peterson to start doing more of that. Just quickly on that one, and besides that being slightly strange. Use them for good. He also says that a professor's role is to be a critic and a conscience. But what I actually think he means by that is that a professor's role is to be critical in a woke sense and a conscience in the sense that you actually have to fawn over anybody who is supposedly a part of a victim group. Something tells me that if his students or fellow faculty members for that matter, were of the conservative political persuasion, that he wouldn't actually have such a virtuous conscience. Well, Professor Peterson, those who are asking for this alternate use of, pro or use of rather, of alternate pronouns, they are saying it boils down to respecting their human rights. How do you respond to that? I don't think it boils down to respecting their human rights. I think that it's an imposition on freedom of speech that's being implemented at a legislative level. I also think that if there was a naturally um, evolving uh, solution to the linguistic problem that's being posed by a small fraction of the transgender community that people would have already adopted it. We've never had a situation 
with, in, with in, in, in the usage of English before that required legislation to produce a transformation in the manner in which people spoke has a very dangerous precedent. So it's one thing to tell people what they can't say. So for example, we have legislation um, making it illegal to do such things as deny the Holocaust. It's a completely different thing to demand that people use certain words when they're formulating their own ideas. And I mean, I can get, it's also absurd. I mean, here's one ha thing that's happened that I don't believe the formulators of this legislation ever foresaw. So in New York City, for example, there are now 31 protected gender identities. And I see no reason whatsoever why each of those gender identities can't de demand the use of their own pronoun. And that uh, absurd things like that have been happening on the University of Michigan campus, for example, where students have been given permission to tell faculty members and others what pronouns they're to be addressed by. And they're multiplying rapidly out of control. So the law is bad from an ethical perspective. It's sloppily written. And besides that, the solution that it imposes is practically untenable. Well, I, sorry, excuse me for jumping in, but I want to bring in Professor Pete here because we did show those words to our audience at home, and perhaps the control room can show it to our audience once again. When you look at those alternate pronouns, I, I think it's fair to say that some people will see that at home and see that as very uh, unwieldy, if you will. Guys, if you're enjoying this content and if you want to help me spread this message far and wide, then chuck a thumbs up on the video. Also, Leave me a comment. You know how much I love to hear your thoughts and subscribe to the channel. So glad to have you. Back to the clips. What do you say to those types of criticisms, including the one you just heard from Professor Peterson? Um, well, I'd like to encourage people struggling with this to be kind as their first impulse. You know, we call somebody what they want to be called in our society. For instance, um, I don't call somebody Julie if they prefer to be called Jordan. Uh, that's just basic human courtesy. Uh, here's a great little tip for people who are despairing at the possibility of remembering some, all those pronouns. What I do is just program in the pronoun next to the person's name in my smartphone. So whenever I'm about, out and about and I've forgotten whether one of my trans friends uses Z or Zer or they or them or something else, I just look it up and it's really super easy. One thing I'd like you to really look at in regard to this controversy is to watch out for who's getting centered in a discussion. Political correctness is code that powerful people use when they're annoyed that they're actually not the center of attention in any given discussion. And Bill yeah. C-16 is actually not about cisgender people. It's about protections for transgender people. And that's not, you know, it's not about Jordan Peterson. So, and you know, we should have people learning to listen more. We have two ears and one mouth for a very good reason. When things get political, I like to ask, who benefits? And who gets to decide the rules of the game? So, you know, mostly with this Peterson controversy, which is really just a small drama, a tempest in a teapot, you know, he could just get over learning to program a few pronouns into his phone. By the way, I only have half a dozen or so that I actually use on an everyday basis. So it's not all that difficult. Professor think, Peterson, sorry, you know, Professor Peterson, good job because I think Professor Peterson wants to, to get in on that. Yeah, well, kindness is the excuse that social justice warriors use when they want to exercise control over what other people think and say. So, you know, if we're bandying back and forth uh, our, our differences in values, you know, um, I, I would say that the highest possible value is truth and that uh, one of the concomitants is that is that is that we need stringent protection for freedom of speech so that we can utter the truths that we see fit. And I think that that's a, a value that's much higher than, than kindness, for example. I mean, there's lots of situations in life where, where kindness in the immediate present is not a, the appropriate way to, to react at all. Kindness is the excuse that social justice warriors use when they want to control what other people do and say. Put it on a shirt, ladies and gentlemen, tattoo it on your forehead. And just look how far this notion has come since this was recorded in October of 2016. Way before Jordan Peterson had any wide scale recognition, by the way. Just imagine what was at stake for him when he decided to stand up and tell the truth. He was a professor in an extremely liberal environment. Standing up against these ideas would have basically meant career and reputation suicide for him. And he had absolutely no idea the doors that were about to open for him and the places it would lead him. He was simply after the truth and was willing to accept the consequences. And if that doesn't paint a picture of the man's character, then I don't know what does. But how strange is it looking back at this just over six years ago and knowing that back then, this whole gender pronouns thing was very new and people were kind of just like, eh, 
Yeah, it's silly, but whatever. Now, this beast takes a full-on religious-like structure where people bow at the altar of transgenderism. It's a subject that if you so much as even dare question, then you will be viciously attacked by the blue-haired mafia. I'm not gonna listen to this crap. Now you talk- I have schizophrenia! I don't care what you have. Literally dead need me, misgender me! What Jordan Peterson was doing here was standing up against small lies. Because he understands from decades of studying people and societies and how they degenerate, that small lies turn into big lies until reality itself becomes indistinguishable from fantasy. And look where we are now. And on to the next section now, where the kind and noble social justice warrior's mask starts to fall off. But so for example, well, um, when you discipline children, you often hurt their feelings in the short term so that they can learn to behave properly um, in the medium to long term so that their lives go well. And so this automatic assumption that the people on the social justice warrior side of the equation are motivated only by kindness when they're also clearly motivated by power is something I find completely untenable. And I don't think that Pete's solution to program my cell phone so that I can remember what names people need to be called is a reasonable solution at all. We're, we're actually supposed to now use electronic devices to bolster our ability to speak freely How do in you case remember we names, offend Jordan? someone. Is it so difficult to remember a pronoun? You remember somebody's first name, you remember their telephone number. I mean, I, I think that uh, it's very I don't very, remember very people's first names that... very easily, and I don't remember their telephone numbers very easily. And when I see a stranger, I call them by the pronoun that seems to be in accordance with their presented appearance. And That's you they being appear lazy, that way. Jordan. That's you being lazy. I think there's a very high value that we should also be aiming for, in addition to truth. By the way, throughout this whole controversy, I have told the truth at every turn. So, you know, trying to imply that that's not what's happening on people on the social justice... Am I a social justice warrior? I don't know. But I think that we should be aiming for pluralism. This means recognising more than one set of fundamental principles, fostering independent cultural traditions of minorities, and being willing to share power with people who are different than you. I think if you just stop centering this whole controversy on yourself and how hard it is for you to accommodate genderqueer people, well, have a little bit of sympathy. I mean, those of us who are trans encounter much more greater indignities every day and every week of the month. For example, have you recently had a bank employee accuse you of uh, trying to masquerade as yourself at a bank and then locking down your ATM card and credit card so that you can't use any money? Those are the sorts of problems that trans people face every day, being out of housing, being considered, you know, considering suicide. These are really big problems. My, and my refusal to, prona to use pronouns because left-wing activists want me to use them has nothing to do with whether or not trans people are having difficulties in society. And I'd also like to point out that I've had many well, letters of support. Problem, isn't it? I've had many letters of support from trans people. And, and they tell me that the trans... Uh, the trans activists don't support them, and most trans people Jordan, actually wanted to be referred to as he or she. Doesn't mean they that weren't you my are friends. Untransphobic. They just weren't my friends. Just because you know a few people, just because you've talked they, to a few trans them. people, you you don't know the trans community like the trans community does. You've got no idea no, what it's like. The trans, trans. Professor Pete, the let's, trans, let's, Professor Pete, I'm sorry to interrupt. Let's yeah. let's uh, let Professor Peterson finish his thought, please. All right. So, the the trans activists aren't. Um, aren't proper representatives of the trans community because they haven't been elected by the trans community. They're, Nobody elected they're noisy. you either, Jordan. I'm not speaking for anyone except myself and on behalf of other people perhaps who want to use, who want to maintain the right to free speech. I'm not claiming that I'm a representative of white people or white men or any other group. I'm speaking on behalf of myself. And so I'm not taking... But I'm Professor... Not, P P it never takes too long for the personal attacks and the straw man arguments to start coming from the kindness brigade. Now all of a sudden, Jordan Peterson just wants to make this all about him because supposedly he's a guy who's in this position of power and he just can't handle when the attention is not on him and he just doesn't want to share this alleged power. And obviously he's a transphobe that is basically complicit in all of the societal issues that trans people are facing. And if the mean white men would just swallow their pride and start using all of the made up pronouns that these people want them to use, then we could all just hold hands and start singing All You Need Is Love by the Beatles in unison. And another great point that he raised there was that these people aren't actually elected by any sort of 
body. They have no right to speak on behalf of the groups that they claim to represent. And I have a lot of people that message me on Instagram and email me that technically fall within the LGBTQ umbrella. And they tell me that they are sick to death of activists who think they represent them. And they are sick of being spoken down to and patronized as if they're some sort of eternal victim just because of who they choose to sleep with. And they are sick of being involuntarily used as a pawn by ideologues who they don't even necessarily agree with and who they don't even think have their best interests in mind. And this speaks to a larger issue about identity politics as a whole and how it always descends into chaos. But I digress. Peter, so let me jump in there, though, because we have seen an evolution of language. There are words that we don't use not anymore. Not by legislation. Well, legislation or not, there are words that have evolved. We don't use, for example, I'm Asian. I would bristle if someone called me Oriental. That is an evolution of, of how we use words. How is this different, whether legislated or not? I just said how not, it was different. I, I understand, I, I understand, different. I understand legislatively, but if at the heart of it is to allow a student to study free of what they feel is discrimination, why not help that along? I already made my, my case for why not help that along. I believe that this legislation is extraordinarily dangerous. And there's other elements of it too that we haven't even got to in our society yet, like the protection for gender expression. And I've looked at gender expression in the Ontario Human Rights Code. And as far as I can tell, gender expression is best summarized in, in a single word, fashion. No. Because it's the way that you present yourself in, in public with your clothing and your manner of dress. And so I also think that the legislation that we are bringing forth with Bill C-16, and that's already in place in places like Ontario, also makes the makes uh, fashion criticism something akin to a hate crime. And because there's been so much noise about the identity component of this, we haven't even talked about gender expression. This is appalling legislation. And the idea that referring to someone by the pronoun of their choice is going to radically improve their status in society or their mental health is a completely unproven assumption. I think it'll have exactly the opposite effect. Uh, Professor, so Pete, I, Professor Pete, I want to ask you, because it's been brought up a couple of times, uh, to Professor Peterson's point, if the, this was so popular, if this was so needed, there would be a natural evolution. There wouldn't be need for legislation. Why the need for, for legislating this as, a, as opposed to allowing it to evolve naturally? Well, Bill 16, C-16 and the Ontario Human Rights Code do not actually legislate pronoun usage. They don't specify 31 genders or anything of the, t of the kind. But let me jump in, though. The university is essentially uh, telling, at this point, it's human, human resources people to use alternate pronouns, in, in a way legislating their staff to do this. No, why, wait, why the, legislation no, no, no. the legislation also requires it. The university made clear their concordance with that, um, that assumption on my part by mentioning in the letter that asked me to silence myself that I'm required to act in, in accordance with the provisions of the Ontario Human Rights Act. And so the university knows full well that the legislation does precisely what I suggest it does. It's not written precisely in Bill C-16. It's written in the Ontario Human Rights Code. And if you read the Ontario Human Rights Commission policies on such things, you'll see very rapidly that utilization of preferred pronouns is part of the legislative package. So and that's and just they're actually, that's if you read the legislation, Jordan, you will find out that they're actually called correct pronouns. There's, there's no preference about this. There is on the Ontario, there is on the Ontario, there is on the Ontario Human Rights Commission website where the policy is laid out. And if people don't believe that, they can just go look themselves. Professor Pete, when you hear that this is a free speech issue, that uh, you hear P uh, Professor Peterson in this case essentially saying that he doesn't want to be legislated to adopt new language, what's your response to that? Well, um, I share a number of Jordan's concerns about freedom of speech and academic freedom on campus. These are both very, very important principles and they should apply regardless of what kind of politics you like. For example, if you're a left winger or a right winger or an up winger or a down winger or whatever it is. But you know, the reason why we have laws that protect academic freedom and freedom of speech is primarily to prevent government interference in individuals' lives, in their business. It's there really mostly to protect against a form of structural violence. And they were, these, these uh, free speech laws were actually never intended to be used as all-purpose um, accountability shields, you know, so that you don't have to be held accountable for your actions. I'm, I'm perfectly willing to be held accountable for my actions and the university has already uh, indicated the seriousness with which they view my actions and I also do not believe that free speech laws were there to protect uh, to, to regulate violence. Free speech laws are there because we use free speech to 
um, identify problems in our society, generate solutions to the problems, and then reach a consensus. So freedom of speech is actually the, is, is protection for the mechanism by which our individuals and society properly orient themselves across time. It's not, it's not even a principle, it's the fundamental method by which our societies manage to maintain the stability that they do maintain. What he just said is eerie to hear, and it's as true now as it was back then and as it always will be. And thank God that Dr. Peterson decided to be brave and take the stand that he took, because he has gone a long way to opening the eyes of so many people and lessening the detrimental effect that individuals like Professor Kindness over here use them for good have had on the discourse. I mean, Professor Kindness just made his point very clear. He likened speech with violence, which is exactly what the social justice Marxists will do to be able to control and regulate said speech. Speech that they don't agree with, that is, because they know that they cannot compete in the realm of free speech and debate. So they will do all kinds of mental gymnastics to try and gain control over the language. So like always guys, hit those links in the bio and in the comments, find me on social medias and follow all of my other channels that are all up and running now. And if you guys wanna watch another video, click right here. Until next time, I'm Jake, this is Rattlesnake TV, keeping you armed and dangerous.